Welcome to this video. My name is Suzanne Perazzini and I'm the author of the Low FODMAP Menus Cookbook and the creator of the Inspired Life Low FODMAP Coaching Program. Today I just want to explain what FODMAPs are and give you a few stats at the end of the video. Now FODMAPs is the letters of the word. So F is fermentable for what goes on in the gut when the carbohydrates are broken down. FODMAPs, FO, the O is for oligosaccharides, which includes the galacto-oligosaccharides, which are the pulses and the legumes. The other oligosaccharides, the fructans, can be in wheat, barley and rye, onion and garlic and so on. We're up to the D in FODMAPs, that's the disaccharides, that's lactose. So obviously in milk and cream and cheese. The M is for monosaccharides and that's the fructose, which is in many, in, well in most vegetables and fruit. The FODMAPs, the A is for AND. And the P at the end of the word is for polyols. And the polyols are sorbitol and mannitol. And they can be in some fruits and vegetables and in other places as well. So that's the explanation of the word FODMAPs. It is the carbohydrates in food. And our problem is that we don't absorb the high level of FODMAPs through the lining of the small intestine, so they go on down into the large intestine where they get fermented by the bacteria there. And that causes a lot of our issues. So if you have IBS and you can control the number of high FODMAP foods that go into your body, you're going to be controlling the symptoms. Now just for a few uh, stats, 12 to 15 percent of the population globally have irritable bowel syndrome. So that means if you're sitting in a room with 100 people, 12 to 15 of those are going to have the same issues as you. But because it's a silent affliction and we don't really talk about it, we're not going to know that. So why don't you be the first one to start talking about it and then you'd be really surprised at how others start to open up about it. The more it's known out there and the more it's known that there is a solution for keeping the symptoms under control, the low FODMAP diet, the better for everybody. Now with the FODMAPs themselves, only 25% of people who have a FODMAP problem have a lactose problem. That means 75% of people with a FODMAP issue don't have an issue with lactose. 45% have a problem with fructose, which means 55% don't. So you'd be able to eat the foods with fructose in them, as long as they didn't have any other FODMAPs in them. Now with the polyols, 57% can't absorb the sorbitol, but 20% with the mannitol. So that means 80% of you with a FODMAP problem can um, eat the foods that have got mannitol in them, again as long as they don't have any other FODMAPs in them. So that's the, the different um, FODMAPs, but the, the ones that we can never absorb, and they're also difficult to digest for other people in the population, not just people with IBS, are the oligosaccharides, including the galacto-oligosaccharides. It means things like onion and garlic are probably things that you're never going to be able to eat, unfortunately. They are poorly digested by everybody in the population, but people who don't have irritable bowel syndrome don't really register it as a big problem. They might have a bit of a tummy rumble, a little bit of gas, and they get on with their lives. But for us, because we've got the, the gut-to-brain communication problem, we our guts register it, well, our brain registers it as pain and causes the, the, the bloating is caused by the fact that the FODMAPs obviously are not being absorbed, but the reaction to the gas that's created is more acute in us with irritable bowel syndrome. Now the beans and the galacto-oligosaccharides, beans and legumes, um, pulses, they really are poorly absorbed by everybody as well. I mean, all you have to do is think about anybody who has a whole plate of baked beans. They're going to have some issues with gas afterwards. But for us, that's disastrous. That, that level of gas is going to cause a lot of pain for us. Um, 
Interestingly enough, we can eat small quantities of canned lentils and canned chickpeas, but in very small quantities, like maybe a quarter of a cup. So you could throw those in with something else to make a more complex dish, and then you're getting the nutrients from those chickpeas and the lentils, but keep them at very small amounts or you will have a reaction. All right, that's um, my information for today. If you have liked this video, perhaps you could subscribe to my channel or perhaps just put a like on the actual video. All right, thank you very much for listening and goodbye.